Good afternoon. On behalf of the Coalition for an Equitable Economy, Mass Inc. Polling Group, and the Mass Grove Capital Corporation, welcome to the 2022 Small Business Survey results. My name is Tracy Whitfield, and I'm the Executive Director for the Coalition for an Equitable Economy. For those unfamiliar with the coalition, the Coalition for an Equitable Economy, CEE, or the coalition, was formed in 2020 with a mission to ensure equitable access to capital, business, networks, education, technical support, and other resources for Black, Latino, immigrant, and low-income small business owners in Massachusetts. One of our major goals is to create a sustainable model that will close the wealth gap between white small business owners and business owners of color, specifically Black and Latino. I would like to take a few minutes to thank our partners. Thank you to Mass Inc. Polling Group for conducting this survey. The Mass Inc. Polling Group is a nonpartisan public opinion research firm serving public, private, and social sector clients. MPG elevates the public voice with cutting edge methods and rigorous analysis. Based in Boston, MPG serves a nationwide client base. Steve Cazola, the president, will share the results of the survey in just a few minutes. I would also like to thank Mass Grove Capital Corporation, known as MGCC, and President Larry Lawrence for funding this survey. MGCC's purpose is to create and preserve jobs at small businesses, inclusive of those owned by women, minorities, immigrants, and veterans. MGCC also works to promote economic development throughout the Commonwealth with special attention to business needs in underserved areas, gateway cities, and low to moderate income communities. In addition, I would like to thank the Harvard Catalyst for being our incentive sponsors and congratulate all of you that won those wonderful gift cards. And finally, I would like to thank all of you who took the survey and especially those who distributed the survey. Because of you, we received over 3,200 responses, which is about 1,400 more responses than the survey administered by CEE and partners in 2021. Just to give you a little background about the survey, in 2021, a survey was administered to gauge how small businesses were affected and impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, the survey and the coalition partners formed the Massachusetts Equitable PPP Access Initiative and assisted many, many small businesses in receiving this funding, especially those in the Black and Latino community who was really struggling to access the PPP funds. Now CEE wants to know how the small businesses are recovering from COVID. This survey is geared to help investors lenders, technical assistance providers, and Massachusetts as a whole strategize on how to create equity and advocate for small businesses by obtaining capital, purchasing real estate, the bidding procurement process, and much, much more. With that, we will jump right into the data. We're almost, well, almost, but before we, before we hear from Steve, we'll hear thoughts from Secretary Keneally, who oversees the Massachusetts Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development. He has been a huge supporter of the CEE's initiatives from the beginning, and we are truly grateful. Secretary Keneally began his career in private equity at TA Associates. In 1997, he joined Spectrum Equity, a firm founded in 1994. During his more than 15 years at Spectrum, he helped grow the firm to become an established market leader with nearly $5 billion in assets under management and investments in over 100 high growth companies in the information economy. After his career in the private equity, in private equity, Keneally spent two years as a special advisor to the receiver at Lawrence Public Schools, working with the state appointed superintendent receiver on the school's district turnaround plan. Great job. Prior to joining Governor Baker's cabinet as secretary in 2018, 
Keneally served as Assistant Secretary for Business Growth at EOHED beginning in early 2015, playing an integral, integral, integral role in advancing the administration strategy for job creation and business development. Keneally and his family lives in Lexington, where they have been highly involved in town government, education, and youth sports. He previously served as chair of the board of trustees at St. John's Prep in Danvers. Keneally received a bachelor's in government from Dartmouth College and an MBA from Harvard Business Law Schools. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping. We will answer all questions during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation from Steve. But please feel free to drop any questions that you have when they pop up in the chat. And Kareem Reynolds, assistant director for economic inclusion at Boston Foundation and a wonderful steering committee member of the Coalition for an Equitable Economy will um, help with the questions and comments and moderate the, question, the Q and A session. So without further delay, we will hear words from Secretary Keneally followed immediately by Steve Cazola with the poll results. Secretary Keneally, the floor is now yours. Well, uh, Tracy, thank you so much for the kind introduction and having me here today. And thanks as always for your work, uh, your partnership with the coalition. I uh, also want to acknowledge our colleagues at MassLink for their research, their analysis and their data. Uh, and as always, of course, our colleagues and friends at MassGrowth Capital Corporation, Larry Anderson and team have been, uh, they are uh, good partners in normal times and absolutely indispensable, indispensable partners in the times we've lived in recently. And always great to see Senator Gomez. I think the last time we uh, met in person might have been at a small business event in Springfield. So uh, great to be with all of you um, here today. Um, I think this uh, survey is a really important contribution to our policy deliberations on, on the state of small business and the Commonwealth, where we are now coming out of the pandemic and what are the needs and opportunities for our small businesses. And I will say it's consistent with a set of questions we've been asking ourselves here in our office about what should be the go forward small business strategy. We're asking ourselves tough questions, for example, on how do we address capital gaps for our small businesses? How do we promote more activity in our downtown and our downtowns and our main streets where a lot of our small businesses operate? How do we create more connectivity across the capital providers and other members of the small business ecosystem? How do we come to the table with more technical assistance for our small companies? Uh, and finally, how do we promote more equity and ownership among our small businesses, particularly with respect to real estate, among other matters? Um, we have, as always, tried to be an active and engaged partner uh, to learn what's happening on the ground in our communities and come up with solutions for our small businesses. Um, I'll note uh, to start that back in the very early days of the pandemic, March of 2020, we started doing a weekly call with all the business groups around the state. We still do the monthly today, but it was enormously helpful then and enormously helpful now to hear what's happening across our, our cities and towns with respect to business generally and small business perhaps in particular. Uh, and a great avenue for us to, to communicate the things we're working on. Uh, the Coalition for an Equitable Economy, many other organizations, Small Business Strong, our CDCs and others, our dialogue with them has been incredibly uh, useful uh, for how we think about what the strategies and policies ought to be. And then finally, um, it was a year ago, just about a year ago, I wrapped up a 24 downtown uh, small business, uh, small business at downtown tour across the Commonwealth. We had 24 communities over a period of a couple of months. And to really get out there, and in this case, meet with 90 small businesses, 70 community partners, to see what's happening out in our communities was, was enormously helpful. I will say that was probably the first time we heard in detail about inflation and supply chain issues before I think those became as prominent in, in the press, for example, as they are now. But when you, when you are face-to-face -face with a restaurant owner, for example, in Chelsea, and they're talking about the increase uh, in cost for some of the, the key supplies they need, you really understand there's a problem there on the ground. Uh, I thought what I might do is just run through uh, things we have done for small business, uh, for small business policy, things that are in process and things we're hoping to do going forward. Uh, and I think it is, uh, I'm heartened in reading the survey results that think that I, I think perhaps we're on the right track, but it does, uh, is always highlight the urgency of these needs and opportunities uh, for our small businesses. Uh, you know, as, as folks are probably aware, we had the largest state-sponsored small business relief grant program in the country, $700 million, uh, so capably administered by Larry and team at Mass Growth Capital uh, to help 15,000 small businesses. 43% of those grants went to minority-owned businesses, 46% went to women-owned businesses, 
We have funded small business technical assistance at record levels now consecutively, consecutively for a couple of years. I thought it was interesting in the survey that the folks who have uh, been the beneficiaries of technical assistance, for the most part, think it's really useful, but that's only about 15% of the businesses. So perhaps there's more we can do there to increase the reach of those services. And I, the idea that there are still revenue shortfalls out there has been something we've been concerned about for a while now. Um, and it looks like it's an ongoing problem. At various stages of the pandemic, we have had our My Local campaign, our Let's Go Out campaign, travel and tourism recovery grants to try to get people back into our downtowns, back in their communities and spending money with their local businesses. And that I think has to be part of our message going forward, that before you, for example, make an online purchase, think about going downtown or going elsewhere in your community and spending money with a local business there. In, um, in terms of ongoing programs, again, through Mass Growth Capital, we've had some programs I think are consistent with some of the needs identified in the survey. The Biz and Power program, which is a uh, sort of matching fund crowdsourcing program, a way to get more capital uh, for our small businesses. Our Empower Digital program, I think could be helpful serving the needs and desires of our Main Street businesses to do more business online and have digital marketing and more digital commerce capabilities. And as always, there's a broad portfolio of programs through mass growth capital and mass development loans and other products uh, to help our businesses. Uh, I do wanna highlight a few things that are, I, I characterize them as potential uh, sources of funding. Uh, having uh, lived through the pandemic and, and, and come to the table with, with a lot of uh, substantial grant support for our small businesses. One thing we've been very focused on now is trying to address long-term sustainable sources of financing that are more growth-oriented versus relief-oriented, I think consistent with the times we're in right now. We are awaiting uh, feedback from the U.S. Treasury on a proposal through the State Small Business Credit Initiative, or SSBCI. Uh, if successful, this would be substantial capital for mass growth capital, mass development, and mass ventures across a variety of debt and equity products that we think would be quite helpful. And we do have a proposal in front of the legislature now. This is filed as part of the governor's May supplemental budget, about $130 million of programs for small business, $80 million on focusing on closing the gaps in commercial real estate ownership. We recognize that if a business can own their real estate, that accomplishes two important objectives. One is stability. You literally own the location you operate in. And the second is wealth building. And so we are we'd be, we would be excited to um, increase our real estate financing capabilities. You know, a lot of times businesses have financing lined up, but there's a gap somewhere in that capital stack. These programs can be helpful in that regard. And the other program I'd highlight is what we call our Impact Lending Partnership Program, which is a $50 million proposal. Uh, it's a competitive grant program for partnerships of banks and nonprofit lenders like CDFIs and CDCs to help them reach underserved or unserved businesses uh, through loans and technical assistance and other, other help. Uh, recognizing again, these capital gaps are real and recognizing as well that these needs uh, fall disproportionately on minority on small business. So as always, we'll endeavor to be the best partner we can be for small business. And I'm so grateful for the survey and the insight it provides. Um, it will inform other aspects of our work as well outside of our direct strategies for small business, but how do we think about downtowns? We've been very focused post-pandemic on investments in our downtowns uh, as folks perhaps are reimagining what a downtown might look like coming out of the pandemic. We as always remain laser focused on trying to solve a housing crisis in the Commonwealth that impacts, uh, I think, every citizen, every community, and every business. Uh, and finally, as always, focus on workforce skills. How do we close skills gaps around the state and make sure our employers have the talent they need? But I really appreciate the chance to be with you today. Uh, deeply grateful to the Coalition of Mass Inc. and Mass Growth Capital for your ongoing partnership and, and this really important survey. So thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Keneally. We are so grateful to have you here. So grateful that you have been a partner along with us this whole ride, this whole journey during COVID-19, helping the small businesses. It has been really, really difficult, but you've been there every step of the way. So thank you so thank much you, for Tracy. joining us. Hopefully you could stay for a while, but we're going to turn it over to Steve, who is the founder and president of Mass Poll Inc., right? Mass Inc. Polling Group. <laughs> All right, Steve. All right, thank you, Tracy. Um, and it's great to see all of you here today. Thank you for taking time to 
join us today and to, uh, as we walk through the survey results. As Tracy mentioned, we'll have lots of time at the end for questions. So if you have a question as I'm going through these results, I'd encourage you to just use the chat function or the Q&A, um, and we'll be keeping track of those and, and collecting them all at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and walk through some of the most uh, the sort of most notable results of the survey. Of the survey. These slides and also top lines and cross tabs from the, the survey will be um, posted at our website, massingpolling.com. Uh, either they already are or they will be shortly. Um, the slides and a, and a recording of this event will also be available on our website. So uh, go ahead and check that out. There's just so much more data, so many more kind of ways to cut the data and so forth that you can that you can look at if you're just thinking after the 44 slides I'm gonna go through, you just can't wait to get some more. So. Anyhow, so we are talking about a survey of small businesses in Massachusetts. The way we defined that for the purposes of this survey were businesses with under 500 employees. Um, and you should be now looking at uh, a PowerPoint set of PowerPoint slides. If you're not, then if one of my co-panelists could wave their hands and let me know. Um, otherwise, we'll just go ahead and proceed. Um, the, a, a few details about the survey. We had a very, very large response to the survey. Over 3,000 small business leaders in Massachusetts responded to the survey, a total of 3,243. Um, the survey was conducted from late June through early, through early August, distributed by um, MGCC, various business associations and other business organizations across the state. The data for those who are, are interested was weighted slightly by, um, or I should say weighted by just a couple factors by gender and by race and ethnicity of, um, of the company ownership. And the reason that that was necessary was because we got oversamples of particularly businesses owned by entrepreneurs of color. Um, and that, as you'll see, lets us cut the data very finely in, um, in many instances and lets us really understand the, the picture at a very granular kind of level. Thank you to all of our sponsors listed here, Coalition for an Equitable Economy, Mass Growth Capital, and also the Harvard School of Public Health for helping us out with incentives. I'd also like to thank all the people on this call who helped distribute the survey. And I also know that some respondents to the survey are on this call. So thank you for taking the time to respond to this survey. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and skip past the key findings for now, just because we're gonna dig into them in a lot of detail. Um, but if you want to know, um, you know, what we thought the key points were or looked at the key findings, that's all gonna be in the version of the slides that is um, that is posted on our website. So starting off then with the current status, where businesses are right now, um, then we're gonna dig into uh, problems that businesses are having or challenges, capital issues, real estate, the whole other set of issues. But the, to kind of set the, set the stage a little bit, what does the small business um, the small business world in Massachusetts look like in terms just of company size. So what this slide shows is um, the dark brown bars here, or the sort of reddish brown bars are uh, businesses that are have $100,000 in business revenue or less. And then the sort of reddish bars here are 100,000 to about half a million. And the, the, the lightest ones here, the sort of pink ones are half a million plus. You can see that overall, so starting here at the bottom, you see 29% of businesses who responded reported in that under $100,000 category for their 2021 total business revenue. Um, and then you've got a third in the next category and about a third in the top category. The reason that I wanted to start here is because when you look at how this breaks down by demographics, it, it relates very closely and strongly to many of the other dynamics we're gonna be talking about. So for instance, businesses owned by women, 35% are in that smallest category, under $100,000. Um, and that's a bit more than the percent for businesses owned by men. Businesses owned by women of color, it's about half. So more still are in the smallest category. Um, and in general, entrepreneurs of color reported a lower amount of revenue or slightly smaller businesses than did, uh, than did other entrepreneurs. So I wanted to call out that relationship because it impacts many of the other slides that we're gonna be talking about. Looking also then just to kind of set up the current picture, what is the current status um, is what we're looking at here in this section. What this one shows is the percent of businesses who said that the conditions at their business were either bad, moderate, or good. So for instance, we had um, we, the question, which they're all listed down here at the bottom was, what is your perception of business conditions at your company? One is very bad, five is very good. And you can see that the, the 
goods, the four and fives, are these pink bars up here. And kind of as you go up this re the revenue categories, the basically bigger and bigger and bigger businesses, more or less you get more likely to say that conditions are good and you get somewhat less likely to say that conditions are bad. Um, and we'll see a whole bunch of reasons that help to explain that as we go through the rest of the um, go through the rest of the slides. Continuing to set the scene about what the current situation is with small businesses in Massachusetts, this question was how annual revenues now compare to your revenues before the COVID-19 pandemic began. Um, and you can see that the, these first three bars here are the people who said they're up. That adds up to 26% who said revenues are up. Um, here you have about the same. And then over here, you've got about half of all respondents, 53% of respondents saying revenues are still down compared to um, before COVID-19. So that too, I think, will help to kind of um, explain some of the other dynamics we'll see as we go through the go through the slides. A couple other key dynamics as we're kind of setting up the picture and drawing, just sort of drawing the background that we're going to be looking at. One thing that we're looking at is the potential for a more diverse small business landscape as we move ahead. So this slide shows two different questions, and they're both listed here at the bottom. One is if any of the senior leaders of your company are planning retirement, and the other is if you have plans to sell the company. Um, and overall, it's about a fifth of uh, businesses say yes, they fall into these categories. But what's interesting is that businesses owned by white owners are much more likely to say that their senior leaders are planning retirement or a sale is kind of somewhere in the near future particularly when compared to Black and Latino entrepreneurs, um, and, and then businesses owned by Asian Americans are just are kind of in the middle of that. We also then broke that down by size, and remember, of course, that this, that these two kind of groupings are closely linked, um, but you, you can see that some of the larger small businesses in, in the state and in the survey are in the, um, are planning a sale or planning um, for kind of upcoming leadership retirements. So, things will look different in a few years. Um, and there's also a number of ways that that kind of impacts the, the slides that we'll be looking at as we move through the presentation. But before we get to that, just a couple other scene setting items. Of course, we're now two and a half years into the COVID-19 pandemic, or perhaps coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic after two and a half years, depending on how you look at it. Um, so we wanted to look just at COVID relief and how those policies had kind of shaken out and who they had touched. Um, and what we found was that uh, almost everybody got something as far as COVID relief goes. You can see that we that the question was basically how much did you receive in total, and we listed all you know various relief programs, um, and then broke that down into categories for people to say how much their individual business got. You can see overall, 14% said they got nothing, 6% said they were unsure. So about 80% of respondents listed some amount of COVID-19 relief um, in response to this question. But we also then asked, okay, who were the businesses that got nothing? And that's what we see on the next slide. Um, you see, starting on the left, we broke that down by size of business and the percents you see in these bars are the percents who said they got nothing. So businesses under the very smallest micro businesses under $10,000, over half of them said they got nothing. Then 29% kind of an among the next category. And you can see that for the most part, it kind of steps down where larger and larger businesses were more and more likely to say they got um, some amount of COVID-19 relief. We also then looked at it by business ownership and found that one third of black owned businesses reporting reported getting no COVID relief at all. Um, and that number was 19% among Latino owned businesses and lower than that for white and Asian owned businesses. Okay, so that's kind of the background. That's this the scene that we're that uh, the, to set the scene. Um, those are some of the key dynamics that that flow through the rest of the slides and the rest of the findings. The next set of slides, the next couple of slides, we're looking at key challenges. What are the things that entrepreneurs find to be the most challenging in the current environment? And to start that off, we asked a question, which was, how much is each of the following a concern for your company? And is it a major concern, a minor concern, or not a concern, which is not shown here? And, and you can see, kind of starting over here at the left, that the two main ones, probably as a surprise to no one, are inflation, rising operating costs, wages keeping up. We also have getting capital. And we have a whole section on that that we're going to get to in just a minute. Um, and then the other one is hiring, which, of course, is another thing that we've heard a lot about in the news, a lot about in surveys that cover the national 
business environment and so forth. Um, and then there's some others, uh, if you're a customer, supply chain problems and so forth. The interesting thing about this is that it varies pretty considerably depending on the size of your business. Larger businesses face some uh, problems in common, but then some also problems that are specific to them. So um, these are the, this is the same question as the last one, as the last chart, and the percentages you're looking at are just the percent we call each issue a major concern. Um, so these are the ones we were just looking at on the previous slide. But then when you break that down by business size or revenue, you see that everybody pretty much is concerned about inflation. I don't, you know, business, individual, I don't know anybody who's, you know, thinks that this is an easy issue to deal with right now. But then below that, you see a pretty big difference in terms of the uh, concerns that businesses are facing at, depending on their size. So if you're a smaller business, you're more likely to say getting capital is a concern and fewer customers, so foot traffic basically. Whereas if you're a larger business, hiring is a much bigger concern. Um, finding enough qualified employees, hiring enough, just hiring enough employees, period. And then also supply chain problems. This one here was a, a much bigger uh, concern for businesses over $500,000 than it was for the smallest businesses. So just a, a, a note to say that, you know, what things concern you are, um, are related to the size of the business that you run. So inflation being the top concern um, showed up on the last couple slides, but what this one shows is that the capacity that businesses have to deal with inflation differs depending on the size of the business itself. So basically the question here was, has your company increased either prices, that's the dark red bar, or employee pay, that's the lighter bar here, um, in response to inflation. And overall, just about, just over half of businesses say, yes, they've done this. But then among your smaller businesses, their capacity to raise pay is less. Only 29% say they've raised employee pay. Only 40% say they've raised prices. Whereas you go up to your larger businesses and you can see that they've been more able to at least respond in terms of wage growth and price, and price growth to you know, the broader inflation environment. Another challenge that businesses are facing is, um, is bills. Um, the, the question here was basically, does your company have three or more months of past due payments for any of the following? We found the most common one that people were behind on was rent um, and mortgages. And here too, you can see that business size really makes a difference. So your darkest bars here are your smallest businesses, medium and larger businesses. And you can see that um, the smallest businesses, you know, you can think back to they were less likely to get COVID um, relief funds. They're more likely to be facing capital concerns, less customers coming through the door. And another issue they're facing is bills being behind on um, rent and mortgage and taxes particularly. This is an also, also an issue of which affects entrepreneurs of color more. Um, and what this one shows is basically the same figures we are looking at as um, on the previous slide, just broken down by business ownership. Um, and you can see that black and Latino entrepreneurs are more likely to face this than our white owned businesses um, and also Asian entrepreneurs to a, a somewhat lesser extent. So that's a quick run through on some of the challenges that business. Thank you. Um, okay, so capital access, digging in on one of the issues, what, what was one of the top issues in the survey, um, one of the top challenges that entrepreneurs said that they were facing. Um, we asked a series of questions, basically, what are you looking for capital for? And what kinds of problems have you encountered in seeking that capital? So this question was, are you seeking new capital for any of the following purposes at this time? Overall, these are just the numbers among all of the respondents. Um, and you can see, for instance, 28% said, um, yes, they're seeking new capital for equipment purchases, 24% said for expansion. And you could check more than one of these. So of course they're not adding up to 100%. Um, and then overall 41% said, nope, I'm not seeking capital at all at this point. Among white owned businesses, that number was actually a bit higher with 47% saying they're not seeking capital at all. Um, and then you can see the reasons that they might be uh, up on the table. But the, things, the thing that really sticks out right away is that the percent of white owned businesses who say they're not seeking capital is far, far, far higher than it is for businesses owned by people of color, where 25% of Asian owned businesses say they are, only 25% of Asian owned businesses say they're not seeking capital and 13% each, each for, uh, for black and Latino businesses. 
So then you look up at why these same businesses are seeking capital, and you can see that it's for equipment purchases, it's for expansion, it's for hiring, it's for investment capital, it's for a whole range of different reasons where businesses owned by people of color are much more likely to say that they're they're seeking capital for various, uh, various plans to grow their business, um, expansion, hiring, equipment purchases, and so forth. Um, so the question then is, okay, you're seeking capital, how's it going? What's the application process been like? Um, and did you what did you actually receive? And the, so the question here is, other than COVID-19 relief funding, has your company applied for or received any new loans or financing in the last two years? Um, and you can see again, it's in the 40s that say they have not applied. Um, and then among those who did, um, you see this is the share that did apply and got everything, that they, they got something and they got nothing. Um, so then what we did from there was basically break that out by demographics. We took just this group, the group who actually said, yes, I applied, and broke that group out by, broke that set of respondents out demographically to see, okay, how did businesses of various size and various ownership experience that application process? So what this chart shows then is, first of all, it's limited to just the people who applied, um, who said they applied for financing in the last two years. And the dark bars here are the percent who said they got everything they asked for. So overall, 23% of applicants said they got everything. Another third or so said they got some and just under half said nothing. Um, but then as you can see looking at business size, that's what this is, it's not the loan amount, it's the your revenue amount. The larger the business, the more likely you were to say you got all um, or all or some, whereas you're getting you're going down and down and down into smaller businesses with lower annual revenues. And you can see that the likelihood that you're getting everything goes down. We also then broke it out by various ownership demographics, basically um, to see, you know, is, are there differences in terms of the percents who got everything or something. Um, and you can see that businesses with white ownership uh, were more likely to say they got everything. Businesses owned by veterans, men, um, and, and so forth. Whereas you look down at the bottom and businesses owned by entrepreneurs of color were the least likely to say that they got everything that they asked for. So then the follow-up question to that, of course, is, well, what, what are the challenges that you experienced? You know, what happened? What were the, um, what, what are the barriers, basically? Um, so the question we asked was whether or not your companies had any of, the, any of the following problems applying for loans or financing. And I should emphasize again, this is just among those respondents who said they had applied. This isn't everybody. This is just the ones who said they'd applied. Um, and you can see that the top issue, of course, is just outright getting rejected. Um, but you can also see that, 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 you know, lack of connections, high interest rates, just the complexity of the process itself and long waits are also major issues. The other thing you can say, you can see as you kind of scan through these charts is that many of these issues were more likely to be experienced by businesses owned by people of color as compared to white owned businesses. Um, there was less of a difference by business size than there was by business ownership. So this is one, you know, thinking back to the link that we established at the very beginning, where you, it's not really business size that's explaining it. It really is business ownership that seems to be explaining more of these barriers further down the list. The top one, certainly there is a difference, but as you kind of move down the list, there's less of a difference just, you know, by business size than there is by business demographics. You can, it kind of summarizes it when you look at the percent who said they experienced no challenges at all. And you can see that 29% of applicants from white owned businesses said that compared to much lower percentages from um, businesses owned by people of color. So what that adds up to is the percent of businesses who say getting capital is a concern, a major concern, a minor concern, or not a concern. You can see overall the number is 60%, but it is much, much higher for businesses owned by people of color as compared to white owned businesses. I'd say this is a, a very common problem. You know, it was number three on the list and it was something that Secret Secretary Keneally um, mentioned, uh, you know, many times throughout the course of his remarks, um, but you can see that it's, there are disparities in the level to which this is a concern, um, depending on business ownership. You also then see this show up in um, the percent of businesses who say that they have a loan, credit card, or line of credit with any of the following. Um, banks are basically banks or credit unions, with banks being by far the most common, 
where um, you can see 42% of black owned businesses say that and about half of Latino owned businesses. And then that goes up for both white and Asian owned businesses to much higher levels. You can also see that it's that um, access to credit is a bigger issue for smaller businesses overall um, compared to businesses that are larger. So one of the ways that one of the impacts that this has is um, more use of alternative funding sources. So here we're thinking like Square and PayPal and you know, payday lenders or Cabbage or any of these other um, sort of alternative funding sources. And you can see that um, businesses owned by Black and Latino entrepreneurs are more likely to say that they use one of these services. Though across the board, most businesses say they're not using any of these. So that is a very quick tour through capital. Um, we're also gonna touch on a couple issues in, in a bit less detail um, and then turn it over to Senator, Senator Gomez for some, some remarks um, on, on this. So touch the first of the um, issues we're gonna touch on in less detail is real estate. Um, what we did here is we looked at whether businesses own their space, rent their space, if they're home-based or have some other arrangement and found that the by far the most common arrangement is renting their space. Um, two thirds, that's the pink pink bar here is rent. Two thirds say they rent their space. That's more common in rural areas. I'm sorry, more common in urban areas than it is in rural where um, owning your space is a, is a tad more common. Um, and it's also, uh, it, it's actually more common in larger businesses whereas the smallest businesses tend to be home-based. Um, you're under $100,000, you are much more likely to be home-based. Um, but this is another area where we've got this sort of pent up energy. You know, we think back to all the issues with capital access and so forth um, and the problems and limitations that particularly black and Latino owned businesses have faced in Massachusetts recently. Um, but if, but we also, the flip side of that is that there is all this pent up energy to expand, to invest, to hire and so forth. And we, we also see that in this slide, which is, would your company like to do any of the following in the next two years with regards to your company space? We see overall 21% say buy new space, but that number among Black and Latino entrepreneurs is 38%. We see similar gaps on renting new space and opening new locations where businesses owned by Black and Latino entrepreneurs particularly, um, but also Asian entrepreneurs are more likely to say rent new space and open new location. So there's, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of pent up energy um, sort of waiting to be released and that shows up throughout the course of these slides. Um, we also quickly wanted to touch on technical assistance. This was another issue of course that um, Secretary Keneally mentioned. Um, and as he said, it's relatively rare that to, um, or I'd say at least unusual um, to, to find, a bus find businesses that say, yes, they have used assistance, coaching, or advice in the last 12 months. The more common, um, more common response was no, we have not. 15% said that they had used TA in the last, um, last 12 months. That was a bit more common in the smallest businesses, more common in businesses owned by LGBTQIA individuals. Um, and also Black and Latino entrepreneurs are more likely to say they had taken advantage of TA. But even there, it was far, by far the most likely response was no, they have not. Um, the rub of that is that businesses that did use TA liked it. 46% um, said it was very useful and another 41% said somewhat useful. This is just the businesses who had actually used TA in the last year. Um, so those who did find a way, you know, sort of find their way to it said that it, it was quite useful to them um, in running their businesses. Among those who did not, um, the most common reason was they don't know what it is. They're not familiar with this kind of assistance. They don't know any providers. Those were kind of the two, by far the two most common reasons for not using technical assistance in the last year. Um, what people are looking for if they were to use TA, that's what this next slide shows. And you can see that the top items that, um, that were on here were uh, access to and help applying for grant funding, finding new revenue sources, and then social media and digital marketing. The percentages you see are the percent you said each one of these kinds of TA would be very useful. So it's interesting to kind of see what's at the top. Also access to low interest loans, getting back to the capital access needs. And then the other thing that's interesting is to see that um, particularly Black and Latino entrepreneurs were, were more interested in a range of these um, 
kinds of TA. Um, businesses owned by Asian entrepreneurs also expressed higher interest, but not, not quite as high as Black and Latino entrepreneurs did. Um, but you can see uh, one place where there is, you know, a pretty big difference, again, sort of thinking back to what we've seen over and over again, is access to low interest loans. Um, so again, capital access is a major issue here. Um, two more quick issues. We're going to look at remote work, and then we're going to look at business with anchor institutions, just a couple slides each. Um, remote work, the interest, there are two interesting things here. One is that um, overall, small businesses mostly employ people working all in person. That's the dark red bar here. 77% um, of small business employees on average are all in person, whereas uh, just about you know a quarter or so are either mostly in person, mostly remote, or all remote. Now, of course, that varies very considerably by what your business actually does. Um, so, of course, office-based businesses are much more likely to be at least partially remote, um, whereas you get down to restaurants and bars, beauty businesses, you know, retail and so forth, construction, and many, many, many more of their employees are, are on site. So that's one note on um, remote work. The other thing, um, kind of reading the tea leaves on where remote work is going, you know, we've seen many surveys of larger businesses showing, you know, that remote work seems like it's here to stay. The same is true for small business employees who are remote right now. Um, there's really not much expectation that uh, the amount of remote work is gonna change in the next year. So yes, most are entirely in person, but of those of that quarter or so who who are remote in some form or fashion, the expectation is that a year from now, that's pretty much gonna look the same. So then just one final issue, we're looking at anchor institutions. We're looking at um, business at uh, small businesses working with entities like larger businesses, colleges and universities, local governments and so forth. Um, and the percentages you see here are the percent you said, yes, they have worked with large businesses, 28%, 22% for colleges and universities and so forth and so on. Um, we also then broke that down by size to see, you know, basically how much more common was it for large businesses to, to work with anchor institutions. The theory being, of course, that the, the administrative burden in many cases and other barriers to working with uh, to working with anchor institutions would be higher and more difficult for, for smaller businesses to surmount. And you can see that pattern does kind of hold for all but not most of these kinds of anchor institutions, where you've got 20% of the smallest businesses saying they've worked with large business, and you've got about twice as many large businesses working with colleges and universities compared to the small ones. Um, and just to make that kind of easy to look at, what we did is we just subtracted the percent in this column from the percent in this column to show how big is that gap? How big is the gap between the capacity of large, our, our larger business respondents um, compared to the, to the smaller ones? And found um, the biggest one is for large businesses, but it's also big for local governments, for colleges and universities and um, hospitals and state government. It's actually smallest for cultural institutions also nonprofits and foundations. There's less of a difference in terms of frequency um, with those. Um, so then just one more slide, which looks at the barriers in um, working with anchor institutions. And we broke it down basically looking at businesses who have worked with them in the past. You know, what's the barrier to doing it again, to doing it more and so forth. And what, uh, and how about businesses who have not worked with anchor institutions? Um, we found the top two are kind of in common, just you don't know how to find opportunities, um, you don't have enough capacity to meet these large institutions' needs. Um, but then there are some divergence, there is some divergence after that, where even those who have worked with them before say it's just too much paperwork, too much time, there's too many regulations. Um, you know, I don't know if I'll, when the bid process, bid, you know, the payment terms are hard, hard to accept. And then the one where those who have not worked with anchor institutions, by far the most, the biggest gap um, in that direction is we just don't offer the services or goods that those ent entities need. So um, th these are the barriers that small businesses express when asked why they're not working with more with anchor institutions. Um, and that brings me to time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I look forward to taking your questions after Senator Gomez's remarks. Thank you, Steve. That was an excellent presentation. Um, a lot of great information. 
Me personally, as a small business owner myself, I'm not surprised by the information <laughs> that was provided, but at least we have the data, the numbers behind it. And so great work from Mass Inc. Polling Group. We definitely appreciate the hard work that you've done. Um, but before we have um, remarks from Senator Gomez, there was a question that um, we think would be best answered by Secretary Keneally. And I don't want him to leave during the question and answer session. So um, I would love it if I can ask you this question ahead of time, Secretary Keneally. Um, and maybe you can um, answer it for us. The question is, the state offered a second relief grant to businesses, however, excluded sole proprietors. Why was that? What was the rationale? Will the grant funds be extended to those businesses as well? Many of us entrepreneurs do not own a brick and mortar business and are in the professional service industry. Thus, we do not have five employees. And that was from Andrea Taylor. Um, I will be around for the Q&A too, by the way. And uh, I might ask, I don't know if Larry Andrews can respond to this one. But we, we did find it difficult for a variety of reasons to um, open the grants to sole proprietors. Uh, we really had our hands full of businesses that uh, had more than one employee, to be honest. In terms of future grants, um, there's, I believe, another, uh, we, we, we as an administration don't have other plans for that. We are kind of more focused now on, on what I've identified as sort of longer term sustainable sources of growth finance for businesses versus relief grants. Um, there is a program that came through in the FY23 budget that we're uh, working with right now on how to deliver that. But I don't know if Larry can reply either online or elsewhere, uh, but that the question on sole proprietorships is one we wrestle with and ultimately decided we had to at least have a, a few employees in the business to be able to serve it adequately. Thank you, Secretary Keneally. I just have one follow-up question. Um, is there a way that uh, funding or grants can be offered to like micro businesses? That's what we call them, like small startup micro businesses. Is there any plans that even look at funding in the future for those types of businesses? Um, we don't have plans on the, on, the, on the books right now, if you will. Uh, but happy to happy to consider that and, and come back to it. I, I will just say that the, the grant programs, we never, as a state, we never really had um, on any kind of scale, small business grants. The, the, the ones we designed and delivered in partnership with the legislature really worried around direct uh, COVID relief. And uh, there's certainly other ways we've endeavored to support startup companies or very young companies, but uh, we might be at a different point in the cycle now where we're gonna consider uh, grants on a larger scale. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. And maybe we can get more information from Larry from Mass Growth okay. Capital um, and relay that information to Andrea. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs> now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Western Mass Senator Adam Gomez. He is a long-term friend of mine. We worked on city council together before he became a senator. Um, senator Adam Gomez is a lifelong native of Western Massachusetts. He is a proud Puerto Rican, a father of three, a former small business owner, and a tireless advocate for veterans, Black, and Latino communities. He is also the first Latino from Ham the Hamden District to serve in the Massachusetts Senate. His personal beliefs and experience have driven his years of advocacy work for social justice issues such as criminal justice reform, immigrant immigrant rights and education issues and civil rights. So without further ado, we would love to hear um, remarks from Senator Adam Gomez. I need permission to turn on my camera. Oopsie, we'll get that for you right now. Oh, suck. Can you see me? All right, take care. So um, first I wanna thank uh, Massing Polling for that presentation. Also, uh, Tracy Whitfield from the um, from the coalition, and also Secretary Keneally. It's always good to, uh, good to see you, my friend. And um, honestly, uh, all the partners that are here today. Um, quite frankly, you know, just looking at the data, um, once it, as it was presented to me, it, it wasn't it wasn't a shocker to see that the gaps that were that have been or that existed when it came when it comes to the black and brown and Asian communities. Um, you know, in me in particular, what I see here in district and what I'm hearing from around the gateway cities is that um, when a lot of the uh, opportunities of funding um, 
really uh, were being marketed that um, for individuals to get the technical assistance um, really, really was very troublesome because um, a lot of the the applications were being graded on, you know, uh, on basically certain paragraphs and things of that nature of how they were written and things that were available to them and not available to them. Uh, I'm a big, strong proponent that I thought that, you know, granted, I wasn't part of the legislature when this process happened, but a lot of the money could have went to micro businesses. Uh, when we talk about smaller businesses, for some reason, a lot of people don't like to use that terminology micro, but the truth and the fact of the matter is that once um, COVID-19 hit, we've seen a lot of people had to figure out how to um, create mobility when being trapped at home and creating these small businesses that um, flourished and were created um, at home. And um, a lot of these were to, to make up for the income that was lost. And, and with the gig economy, some people went driving, went to drive and thought that was a way out. But essentially right now, we're still trying to uh, repair ourselves after these last three years uh, of, of, of during the pandemic. And I know on the legislature side, uh, we would like to see a lot more um, investments within um, you know, our communities. Uh, just to go back to a little bit what Secretary Keneally said of um, when he went around to 24 uh, different communities, um, he did, uh, I was there at the table with him to at least three of those uh, communities that uh, that were in my district that I represent. And one thing that, you know, that is evident is that when people have ex uh, already had expendable income, they can look towards uh, retirement because that's called generational wealth. A lot of black and brown individuals, indigenous individuals, and also other people of colors, uh, we've migrated here from other places and we don't have that kind of generational wealth to say, hey, listen, retirement's right around the corner. Let me work till 55. Our communities will work till 75 if you let us. And essentially, you know, that's not that kind of uh, grit that we were built with. But for the most part, you know, my uh, this information that I've received today, I want to bring it back to my colleagues on the Senate and also share it with my colleagues in the House to see what we can do better to make sure that we're intentional with the investments and making sure that the language that is written, make sure that uh, that DEI language, not just because it's sexy to just put in a piece of uh, of, uh, of legislation to make sure that we're really making those investments in the communities most impacted so we can make sure that uh, there is um, there is light at the end of the tunnel because um, regardless, even the process of certain businesses even receiving the money that they were awarded has a lot of time in between that. Um, our communities need money right now. Uh, and uh, they're struggling and businesses are closing, waiting for even some uh, award letters. So for the most part, I just want to say that this information is critically important for us to be able to move uh, the agenda of an equitable economy and to make sure that all people uh, receive the same respect when going for these necessary funds to make sure not only it's equitable to people of color, but also regionally equity, e equitable because sometimes Communities of color that are out here in Western Mass get totally forgotten um, the most on top of the communities of color that exist in the, the big metro areas like Boston and in Eastern Mass. So uh, thank you for putting this together, Tracy. Look forward to working with all of you to make sure we're building an equitable economy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gomez. Wonderful remarks. We definitely appreciate you joining us. Um, you and Secretary Keneally has, have been great advocates for equi equitable work, and we definitely look forward to working with you, and you will see many, many letters from us advocating to make sure that this equity and fairness happens throughout the state of Massachusetts. We are here to bridge the gap of the state um, with Western Central and Eastern Mass and CEE is here to stay. We are going to do this work because we can be a Massachusetts that, you know, set the tone for the rest of the United States on closing the generational wealth gap, giving equitable resources to everyone in need and making sure that we grow our economy fairly. And so I'm looking forward 
to the work. I am new to this role, but I am so excited about the work that's coming forward. So thank you so much for joining us. We'll now go into our question and answer session. And I will ask um, Kareen Reynolds from the Boston Foundation and also a steering committee member of the Coalition for an Equitable Economy to join on the screen and ask questions and the appropriate um, party for the question will then answer the questions. Thank you, Kareen, for joining us and the hard work that you do at the Boston Foundation. You're amazing. Yeah, no problem. Hello, everyone. I hope you guys are enjoying this rainy afternoon. Um, the first question is going to be up for everyone um, to answer. It's from Colette. And she asks, was there any talk about helping with real estate? Uh, I had to move my business during COVID due to a landlord that was unwilling to work with me. I moved to a smaller location and I'll I will never be able to increase income unless I find a new location. Anybody else, anybody wanna tackle this one or offer any resources to Colette? Um, well, so the, uh, the secretary is coming on or perhaps Senator Gomez, I'd say that this was, this is a, um, it's something that we've seen uh, across both surveys. This is a, this kind of, um, challenge with rent, challenge with landlords, challenge dealing with landlords. It's, it's certainly something we heard very, very frequently. Um, so uh, just to say that this is not that certainly something that has happened a lot during the pandemic is both of the surveys that we've conducted illustrate. I, I agreed. It was one of our key learnings from the, the small business tour we did uh, last year. And it's really why we proposed uh, we, what we put in front of the legislature, which is in effect $80 million of support uh, to help small businesses um, either develop or buy the locations they're in today. We've done a couple uh, transactions recently in that regard. I think it's a, be enormously helpful for these businesses to control their destiny in that way and help the wealth building opportunity that comes with real estate ownership. So hope we can continue to uh, dialogue with the legislature on that one. Um. Honestly, we've seen a lot of individuals when it comes to inflation, certain opportunities present itself that uh, owners tend to not maybe sell a piece of property and, and put that business in, in jeopardy. Obviously, um, I would like to just echo uh, Secretary Keneally that, um, and I know that it's very difficult for individuals of color to acquire certain properties because of the magnitude of the inflation and what it's turned into, depending on location. I don't know the location where she's at, so obviously I don't have resource for her other than, um, you know, uh, just get in contact with my office and whoever's the, the legislature in your district. I would love to partner with them to see if we can find a remedy for you and, and, and with your municipality. Awesome. There is no more responses. I'll go through these because we have quite a few here. Um, the next question here. Any insights on changes from the last survey? Um, and that was asked by Diego. Yeah, so I'd I, say, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I would just say we honestly were focused on a very different set of issues this time, um, just because the last survey was done in kind of summer of 2020 when more of the questions were about just, um, you know, are your doors open or shut and things like that, you know, um, like, are you, still are you kind of surviving um whereas this time there were we could we were digging into a bit broader of a set of issues um the one we did look at is um technical assistance and found um uh and olivia perhaps you could check me on this but my recollection is you, we found a lot of stability in terms of the things that people are looking for um with the exception of there was less of course need now for help applying for various kinds of covid uh, relief funds that's you know not something that's as much of an issue anymore um, but in terms of digital marketing, social media, and so forth, those, I believe, were fairly consistent from the last time around. Awesome. Olivia? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that's that's true, Steve. I just double-checked that the, the things that people are seeking with technical assistance has generally stayed the same other than COVID relief. Cool. Um, Sam says... I'm a woke or woman of color and an owner of an independent grocery store. Um, I've applied for a lot of grants, but they seem to be graded based on how well they're written rather than the need. Um, are there 
can there be a mandate that the grant administrator administrators physically visit locations to determine the eligibility? Depending on the grant where she wrote the where where she applied for, because there are certain grants and levels, obviously, through different municipalities and also through the state. Uh, that's exactly what I alluded to in my comments was that they were being graded and 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 not necessarily what the business looked like and what the business puts out, but necessarily on if if they were a grant writer and nine out of 10, most uh, sole proprietors or individuals that have one or two folks, they're working 18 hour days. Um, they can't go to different resource fairs because they got to keep their doors open from seven to seven or, or whatever the hours are. So it, 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 I do understand her frustration with that, but um, that's something that we can work on and through the, and through the next session to make sure that um, uh, the new office that comes in with the new administration, uh, if there is opportunities of that that magnitude, we can try to make sure that people are going to the locations to to best evaluate those uh, those applications. If 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 it and sen uh, Secretary Kennedy can only say if they have that kind of bandwidth, depending on because obviously the survey we had over thirty three thousand businesses that 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 um, that responded. Uh, yeah, maybe offer a couple thoughts. Uh, you know, we did 15,000 businesses in the in the big $700 million round. It would have been really, really hard, well, frankly, impossible to, to visit all those locations. I, I will say uh, in the Massacre Capital grants, there wasn't a whole lot in there that was um, qualitative in a sense that it was either well-written or less well-written. It really was around uh, quantitative metrics and demographics and things that perhaps a, a visit would always be helpful, but we think we tried to get to the uh, get to the heart of the matter with the, the, the facts presented to us without kind of what it looked like qualitatively. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question here about how do we define a micro business? Yeah, I, I guess that one's for me because I used the term a couple of times. And if it's a term that gave anybody pause or offense, I apologize for that. It was meant to be a shorthand for businesses that were among the smallest of, of those we surveyed. But um, I had no particular definition and certainly didn't didn't mean to, um, you know, offend anybody if that's a term that they objected to. I don't, I don't think I don't think there really should be an offense to, you know, what's a micro business or not. I think what, what it is, is that Truth and what's evident is that, you know, <clears throat> there has to be a solid maybe uh, um, way of us identifying smaller businesses that have one or two people um, attached to them. And then from there, we can create an avenue of understanding those kind of measures and things that those kind of businesses need versus putting them in a pot of, of trying to seek revenue with uh, individuals that have 50 employees, 150 employees to 500 employees. But that's something I think that the legislature has to work on to make sure that we create that class within that realm. But um, I think that's something that, that has to be a statute or, or a change. So then we can make sure that we're, we're really looking into that and mandating it. So heard loud and clear. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I just wanted to chime in on, you know, my micro businesses are actually, you know, the largest proportion of small businesses in the Commonwealth, about 79 to 80% of our businesses in the state are micro. So the way we've tried to define it is under $250,000 in annual revenue and under five employees. And the point is that they have different needs than say a larger scaling business and resources and the way they're allocated and the particular types of technical assistance will be varied based on the needs of those businesses. So I appreciate Senator Gomez's comment that, you know, we while we have um, programs that are generalized, right, for all small businesses, there actually needs to be more nuanced programming and capital for the smaller ones. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karine, before you go on, that is Betty Francisco from the Boston Impact Institute. She is also a steering committee member and executive committee member of the Coalition for an Equitable Economy, and she is a powerhouse in her own right. So, Betty, thank you for joining the panel and chiming in whenever you can. Thank you.
I'd be just build quickly then on what Betty said just about the different needs. You know, that that showed up particularly on the key concern slide, which, you know, when they're posted to slide 15, where you saw very different concerns. Um, you know, they're all small businesses as we define them for the survey, but you know, as you kind of go down the revenue, uh, the annual revenue scale, you see that concerns are much more about people just aren't walking through the door as much anymore and they're not, yeah, we can't get the money we need to, you know, continue to operate rather than I can't find enough employees because that's less of an issue if you don't need to find as many employees um, and less likely to be suffering from supply chain problems. So certainly a different set of concerns. Thanks, Steve. So um, there's a lot of questions about technical assistance in the chat, and I'd love everyone to chime in on some of these questions. Um, I'll group them together and folks can kind of take them on as you can. Um, a lot of them are asking for resources. So I encourage folks to share the resources that you're knowledgeable of and direct people to um, um, uh, to where they can find those resources, okay? All right, so first folks are talking about um, SSBCI um, grants. And you know they've been utilizing technical assistance support and they want to know how easily accessible will the SSBCI be for small businesses? That's our first question. And then the second question is, how do you register for technical assistance? Where can um, maybe a, specifically a small home care company find technical assistance? Um, and where can they find this information about grants as well? Who wants to go first? Well, maybe just quickly in SSBCI, we're still awaiting our uh, feedback from the Treasury on our proposal. Um, our, our proposal does not include grants, by the way. It's a variety of, of debt and equity products. And we will, of course, endeavor that those will be easy to access through mass growth capital, mass development, and mass ventures. But it's uh, it's very early days. In fact, in a lot of ways, the game hasn't even started yet with SSBCI, but hopefully we'll get positive feedback soon on that one. On the technical assistance questions, I would encourage uh, those individuals to put put your email in the Q and A if possible, and we can follow up with you because there are a number of programs and organizations that do technical assistance, but they're they're by region, and it depends on what you need. So for us to refer you to the best possible partner for this, we'd like to probably just do get a better sense of what you're looking for. And I'm happy to make those introductions and connections. Um, so just put your email so we can communicate back with you. It, it, that's a, Betty makes a really good point. I know with our technical assistance program, we fund uh, 60 or 65 providers around the state uh, it, and literally all around the state. So having this kind of regional approach, I think would be the best way to come at it. Thank you. Yes. And if you do put your email in the chat, the Coalition for Equitable Economy has many partners that offer technical assistance. Um, Betty's organization is one, but we have others and they focus on different um, um, industries and different regions, like Betty says. So please, please, please drop your email and we'll get information to you as soon as possible. I'll also put in the website for Masco Capital, which is empowering small business, uh, org, And there'll, there'll be the list of all the, uh, all the providers on that website too. Thank you very much. Thanks, y'all, for sharing those. Um, you know, at the Boston Foundation, I've had the pleasure of supporting a lot of uh, technical assistance programs, just like um, some that were mentioned in the comments. Um, you, it depends on industry. I, I will double down on that, but I will also mention Small Business Strong. Um, that is a that is a program where you can put some information about your uh, business and they will have someone contact you directly to kind of talk through what those business needs um, you have are and um, identify uh, the help and get you the help that you need. So Small Business Strong is that program. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, there's a lot of technical assistance steps. Um, any, how about um, 
So, so Barbara says that the biggest challenge is finding employees. The cost of living on the Cape is so prohibitive. I can't imagine how going forward I'm going to find people. Can anybody speak to um, hiring and and retention efforts that may be out there? Well, I'll speak to the cost of living on the Cape, which is mostly driven by housing. And I, you know, we've been using the term housing crisis for a long time around here. That's where the state is. We're in a housing crisis. And I think there might be a perception that the housing crisis is limited to Boston or greater Boston. It's not. It's all over the state. And perhaps in a lot of ways, it's, it's felt most acutely uh, on the Cape, where the difficulties in sustaining a year-round workforce, it's so problematic given the, the, the cost and availability of housing in Cape Cod. And so we have, for example, in one of our proposals to the legislature, uh, $200 million in workforce housing with a specific allocation for the Cape and the Berkshires. So it's a, it's a major, major problem, the availability of housing on, on the Cape to sustain a year-round workforce. And we've taken some steps to try to address it. Awesome. Um, Secretary Keneally, what strategies will your department implement to address capital access disparities highlighted in the Massing Small Business Survey? Uh, you know, great question. I, I'd say a couple of things. One is the, is the technical assistance could be helpful in that regard, helping businesses access uh, capital providers. And I'll point to the other proposal I mentioned before that we made in one of the, uh, the governor's supplemental budgets this year with $50 million for what we call the Partnership Impact Fund. And it's, it's essentially grant funding to facilitate a partnership between banks and nonprofit lenders uh, to help them uh, access uh, underserved or unserved uh, borrowers. So that, that, that's where we're trying to come at that one, uh, both technical assistance uh, and this, this sort of new funding tool that could be quite helpful. All right, these are more comments rather than questions, <laughs> but if you feel so moved to also expand upon those comments, um, feel free to do so. A lot of people um, express frustration about being rejected once being um, applied for some of these um, programs and, and access to capital. Um, small businesses, one comment is small businesses definitely need help with purchasing COVID supplies, um, hiring and advertising to recruit new clients, et cetera. So that's something that, that's been highlighted and lifted up that I think was also uh, highlighted in the, in the, the results of the survey. Um, what else do we have here? Um, we, there are also, people are commenting about the housing crisis and how they believe that it, it'll it definitely affect the way that they um, are doing business. But I have some backup questions here um, that I'd love to ask all of you. What's the biggest takeaway from the findings um, that we've you know outlined today? I can start with you, Senator Gomez. The biggest, <clears throat> the biggest takeaway is just seeing the gap where, in, in my mind, where I've always seen it and where I've always advocated for is that people of color, we need more a piece of the pie. We need a little bit more investment. It's the truth. <laughs> we see it's not skewed that way. It just shows what's evident and what's, and, and truth be told, you know, a lot of people, you know, I, I was very surprised even that you guys got at least 33 100 people to reply to the survey because a lot of folks, they're so busy, they don't even have time to res respond to surveys. So just imagine for the people that out there that didn't get a chance to, 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 to respond because they were so busy trying to keep the doors open in their business. So um, one of the biggest takeaways that I'm going to, um, well, that's one of the biggest takeaways that, you know, for, for such a long time, even pre-pandemic, um, our communities lacked um, resources and the the big word that people like to use is exacerbated and it showed and it's still showing and we still need more uh intentional um I'm, I'm trying to be kind so more intentional progress but for the most part uh i know that we've uh created really good partnerships with with the secretary 
And obviously, we've been trying to close that gap as best as possible this last session. But we know that we have a lot of work ahead of us, uh, tremendous amounts of work. So I'm here to just say that I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get to it. Thank you, Senator. And Betty, as a practitioner and advocate for equitable economy and, and equitable business support, what, what was something that stood out to you? So a, a couple of things, the access to capital gap is uh, obvious. You know, we probably didn't need a survey to tell us that, uh, but what it does guide us in is what kind of capital, right? So we know that we need more supports for our smallest businesses, our micro businesses, and it's most likely grant capital with, um, very, and if it is loans, it's very low cost flexible types of loans. So it gives us a sense of what are the needs and the nuances around um, capital access that we need to work on together, right? Uh, not just our our small business uh, technical assistance providers, but it's in coordination with the state and the funds that are available, as well as impact and philanthropic dollars that uh, want to support uh, small businesses, but may not be sure where to uh, invest yeah. those monies in. So that that's one is the the ways the nuanced ways in the in which we can direct money differently, and that is a priority for the coalition. The second uh, sort of important thing that I took away is in the first couple of slides that Steve presented around transition of businesses. So our larger white owned businesses are looking to exit or transition in the next couple of years. And it frankly creates an opportunity, right, for transitioning those businesses to worker ownership, right? Is there a chance for workers to become the owners of those businesses? Or is there an opportunity to transition those businesses into black or Latino or Asian ownership? So that is something that from a policy perspective and programming, we could begin to work on because we don't want those businesses to go away or to exit to a larger company that is gonna take away jobs, right? And, and move those businesses out of the local area that they've been so supportive of. And then the last, my sort of equitable takeaway here is on our technical assistance. I was surprised by that number, why it's so low, like, cause there are so many providers as you saw um, from Small Business Strong to all of the SBTA providers that mass growth capital funds, including ourselves. There are many of us trying to support businesses, but you can see that many businesses don't know that those resources are available. So it creates, again, this uh, opportunity, I would say, for us to promote this work differently so that businesses know how to reach us, how to find us, and, uh, and, and how to tap into just the richness of supports that actually are available in Massachusetts and want to support our smallest businesses and our uh, businesses owned by people of color and women. So I, I, I just also encourage for there to always be this dialogue of what can we do better? What can we do better to, to reach and create deeper relationships with our small businesses? Anybody else want to give a brief comment on that? Or I can go to more um, crowd-fielded um, questions. Just maybe <clears throat> quickly, a couple of things I did try to put in. Uh, my colleague beat me to it. Empowering Small Business .org is in there. And I see that Karen put in Small B Strong as well for Small Business Strong. Two terrific uh, resources for small businesses. Um, and on my answer on capital, uh, I'm reminded that we did uh, contribute $21 million to CDFIs over the last year, and they're an important source of capital for small businesses. In terms of what was, um, I figure it was most notable or surprising was the question, but uh, one aspect of the report that stood out for me, which I hadn't really thought about before, are the, the anchor institutions, and to the extent those could be important customers for our small businesses, and to the extent um, they probably aren't right now, to the degree they might be. And I think it's something for all of us to think about. You know, if you're a, a very important, by definition, anchor institution in your community, how can you open your doors uh, for small businesses? And how can we help our small businesses access those institutions as customers? So it makes something for us to uh, think about going forward. I thought that was a really interesting piece of the report. And I just want to add, Kareem, since we did give a plug out for Small Business Strong, I want to also say that 
BECMA, Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, is also a technical provider that also gives out grant funds and offer other, other resources. And they also have an event happening this weekend. So it's tickets are still available if you want to go tomorrow um, to get some of those resources. Um, just don't want to leave anybody out. And if I did, I do apologize, but we will be um, distributing some information um, to those who drop their email in the, in the Q&A. Thank you, Tracy. Um, uh, from the audience, uh, there's a, a comment and question here. I received a grant in 2020 as a small business. I got $6,000. And in 2021, when I applied, I was rejected. But the volume of paperwork being asked from me to account for is the equivalent um, of those larger companies who received $100,000 or more. Do we think that's fair? Not knowing what the program was, I'm not sure I can comment. I will say some of the early uh, grant funds came from uh, federal sources, which um, by definition have a lot of paperwork associated with it. So I'm thinking back to the very early things stood up with community development block grants, which are federal money. I know the paperwork is pretty onerous on that one. So, but without, without knowing which exactly which program it was, a little hard to comment. I know on our side, we, we tried to make um, make this as streamlined as possible. It's uh, it's never easy. You want to get the money out the door as fast as possible, and also make sure you're you're doing right by compliance and other other matters. Uh, perhaps particularly when it involves well, in all cases, but but federal money does come with its own its own. Uh, compliance questions. Thank you, Secretary. All right, if no one else wants to comment on that, we'll go to the next question here. Where do you, you see all commercial real estate or brick and mortar properties values in the next three to five years? West versus East evaluations would be helpful. Well, one of my rules here is not to make predictions, but uh, you know, we, uh, I, I, it's interesting. We, we did a, a, what we call the future of work study. We I released it last summer. And uh, again, in the spirit of not making predictions that describe scenarios on how work and life may change around the Commonwealth and how with people able to work in remote and hybrid manner, it may sort of shift the center of gravity as we called it away from greater Boston to other parts of the state. And so those are, that's an example of trends we're watching you know, will people decide to live further outside of Boston? Will the ability to work remotely open up different, uh, both residential and commercial opportunities around the state? So I think it's a bit early to, to uh, tell what's happening now and certainly don't want to be in the forecasting business, but we are watching very carefully uh, population trends and other trends around the state. I think you muted, um, Kareem, but in the interest of time, we are losing some of our panelists, and there are quite a few more questions in the um, Q&A section along with um, some comments, and we will be sure to read those questions and comments, and if you did provide your email, you'll get some follow-up information from us, especially on how to obtain the technical assistance um, that you're looking for, but we want to Thank, from the bottom of our heart, Secretary Keneally for taking this 90 minutes to be with us today. We wanna to thank all of you for taking the time for being with us today. Thank you to our panelists and to Mass Inc. Polling um, Group for the wonderful job that you did on the survey. Thank you, Kareen, for the question and answer moderation. Um, we had a wonderful time with you today. And we look forward to having more of these sessions, even in smaller groups. I'm hoping to go throughout the state and fill some of these questions and, you know, start strategic planning with CEE. We're starting that actually in a couple of weeks to see how we could take this survey and put it into action because there's no reason to have a survey with such great information and such great details and not do anything with it. So we plan on building our strategic plan. And when I say our, I'm saying the Coalition for an Equitable Economy and 
a lot of these people on the panel are partners and we consider Secretary Keneally a partner too because you work so um, much with us and we Thank definitely you. appreciate yeah, it. You're welcome. Um, right. So without further ado, we will not take up any more of your time. You have been a great audience. Thank you again for taking the survey, distributing the survey and for your thoughtful um, feedback and comments in the Q&A. Uh, we definitely appreciate it and we will see you all next time. Thank you very much. And have a wonderful afternoon and day.